Thanks so much for doing this. You're welcome. I mean, it's not hard to get musicians to talk about themselves, is it? <laughs> well, funny you should say that because I was looking um, on YouTube for interviews with, with you, and I thought there'd be tons of them, but there weren't. Which is uh, there. I'm sorry, just thing. looking for the full screen meeting here. Oh, there it is. Um, there's a couple of podcasts, I think. Right. Right. I see. Um, yeah. yeah. One, uh, oh, I forgot Joseph's uh, pivot point. Did you hear that one? No, no. That's a really, that's a really uh, comprehensive one. Right. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, I, I don't. I probably not many people are that interested in speaking to me. Ugh. Oh, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I mean, uh, just checking out the stuff you've done. Oh man, it's like you've worked on the movies of the sort of. It sounds pretentious, but the soundtrack to many different people's lives, so many of the films that have affected so many people. I mean, I tell you what, I normally write um, a little jingle for everybody I have to do an interview. And I started one and um, I had to ditch it. I had to ditch it. I played, played to my wife who was a musician. It's like, no, 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 no. I'm just trying to cover loads of different bases. I tried to do I tried to do this sort of Celtic thing, which was inspired by some of the stuff in the Hunger Games movies, you know, that rootsy sort of bluegrass kind of thing. And right. I tried to tie loads of stuff together, which made me think about the breadth of what you do, really, which there's so many different kinds of scores you've done and so many different kinds of textures. That there's, uh, there's, well, I'm sure we could talk for hours and I'm sure people would have thousands of different questions, but it's such a broad bag of stuff that you've dealt with in your whole career. It makes me uh wonder what sort of breadth of influence do you have because you've covered so much where where did it start basically well, i i probably covered a lot because i've been doing it for a while now and also um i've worked for some brilliant composers who themselves have you know such a great gift and a great range and also in a period uh from the late 80s sort of till now where there was a uh, still what we call the last golden age of orchestral music up through the early 2000s. And then things kind of shifted a little bit after that. So I suppose there's that. Um, but, you know, um, to answer your question, I got started like a lot of people. Um, piano lessons when I was a kid. Uh, got kind of hooked in the 70s, um, early 70s on the piano parts in pop music, of which there were many great ones started, you know, taking them down by ear because they weren't always in the sheet music, then had a kind of jazz teacher along with my classical. I'm giving you the quick comprehensive. And um, that got me interested more in, you know, writing, improvising, arranging, uh, writing, writing some songs. And then um, I guess when I started university in my hometown is when I really got hooked properly on orchestral music yeah. uh, in addition. And um then I moved down to L.A. You probably know some of this. Went to USC for a year, the very first year of the film scoring program that's still going on. And I also believe, um, I feel fairly certain this quite possibly is one of the first film scoring programs ever. Yeah. Of which now there are so many everywhere. And um, that I got to meet. Well, my teachers were some of the great teachers of the golden age, David Raxon, Fred Steiner, Alexander Courage, they were all my teachers. Right. And uh, I met Alex North, Jerry Goldsmith, um, Bruce Broughton was my teacher. So that kind of, you know, got me a good entree. And then a year after getting out of USC, I got out in 85, um, two things happened. Bruce Broughton put me in touch with Chris Young, who I uh, had never had an orchestrator before. And I met Elmer Bernstein's orchestrator, um, Christopher Palmer, 
when I was doing some copy work on a session and I was librarian and Christopher, I heard use assistance. So I asked him to look at my music and he said, okay, uh, I have a big project coming up in uh, what was in actually in Nuremberg. It was um, Elmer Bernstein conducting uh, suites of Miklas Rocha's music, which Christopher had put together. And he sent me two of them to, uh, if you will, to orchestrate, but Christopher marked up Dr. Rocha's sketches so clearly with every specific. I always said it looked like a spider that had stepped in ink and walked all over the page. Yeah. So my job was to not miss anything. And uh, from there, Christopher had worked for me and I started spending my time living in England as well as LA because I, I really love it here and the sensibilities. So there's a, a quick capsule. If you can endure 30 more seconds, um, within a couple of years, I had met George Fenton and he asked me to start working for him in early 90s on Mem or sorry, early 1990 on Memphis Bell. And then he, well, we went to LA to record a film score, final analysis. And I think this was my first proper big foray in Los Angeles. Chris Young had done one or two small things in LA, but uh, otherwise everything had been done over here. And I guess um, I, well, I was told later I might've done a good job. I got noticed by the great Sandy de Crescent, who's the fixer, was the fixer over there, and Richard Kraft. And uh, I, I promise I said 30 seconds, but I'm about to be done. This is great. And a um, couple years later, Mark Shaman needed an orchestrator because his then orchestrator was moving on to compose. And I was put in touch with him and met James the next year, met Rachel Portman the year after that, and sort of that's been, they were my staple. Uh, <laughs> and all doing different things from each other and all on amazing films, of course. So, yeah. Um, and there, that's that's kind of it. You know, James always said to me and others that, and so did his agent, Sam, uh, that you couldn't design a career like James's. And James is brilliant, but he always says, you know, there was an element of luck in that he got good pictures, which led to good pictures. And I feel the same is true for me. Um, I got to work on pretty decent stuff, and that always seemed to, you know, uh, roll into a continued pattern. So um, until uh, <laughs> until Los Angeles gets rid of me, or the film business gets rid of me, I'll keep doing it as long as they still want it. Uh, I'm sure this is going to go for a very long time. That's really strange. You should mention David Raxin because I had uh, I studied for a while with a guy who studied with David Raxin. Oh, who was that? Guys. His name is Ahmed Sen. He used to run a film course in London. Oh. I don't know how much he did, but he was a very, very good teacher. I think he, he uh, it, it was Berkeley, I think. David Raxin must have done some guest lecturing there or something. Oh, perhaps so. And I was thinking about the change in, in, the, in the way that movies are scored. You think back to that movie, Laura, which I suppose a lot of people wouldn't see, but it's a lot of classic film noir. You think everything that happens in that movie, like a door is shut, they hit that. You know, somebody sits down the music hits everything it catches like so you many think so? i think so yeah if you oh. that's my recollection of it like it catches so many things anyway the music catches a lot and now i i wanted to know what you thought about that sort of progression is how how do you see that in terms of how much how many things are hit and well you're using the word hit and catch which quite often we associate with things that have a more extreme version of that, such as the very obvious one, animated things, especially from the early days yeah. and such. But you make a good point in that the music in films in the 40s, 50s, even up through the 90s, it shifted more with changes in action. It had more, you know, of that. Uh, mm -hmm. It had themes that, that could give information that wasn't on the screen. That trend, as I'm sure you well have observed, Andy, is is kind of mostly gone filmmakers want the music flatter just in the background rare that they want it to be a to have a thematic character uh, maybe they'll allow you know some kind of motif and, and so rarely some sort of main title but yes that has changed a lot um, that's gone with the style of filmmaking um, it's not it's not uh that it's never been that way, but you are right. That's, uh, I mean, I always love David Raxon's score to the bad and the beautiful too, because it has such a long, 
arcing, you know, line, the melody. Right, I don't know that. Right. Oh my gosh, you should watch that film. It's it's a film about Hollywood, set in Hollywood. Oh, okay. Okay. You know, yeah. old Hollywood. It's fantastic, and the music's just gorgeous. And it, the moods, you you will you will see, like you said, there's a there's a little light scherzo that when when things are going well, and and there's the darker drama. But um, you know, it's a very good point because you don't want to be. If the film already says something, the music doesn't need to redundantly also. Yeah. And the great thing about the old days, which is long gone, and, and David Rexon, I should call him Mr. Rexon, and God rest his soul, um, would talk about the fact that, you know, the in fact, it was him that said this story when I was so young about how, um, you know, let's say a man and a woman are talking, and that woman you knew was in love with a different man. And she, when she was with that different man, there was a certain theme play. But when she's talking with, let's say, her husband, saying, don't worry, I'll never leave you, I love you. But the theme is playing from when she's with the other man, and that tells us she doesn't mean what she says. Wow. Yeah. Do you know a film called A Place in the Sun? Franz Waxman's score. Montgomery I, 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 I think I've seen it, but I, I can't remember it at all. That's another one that uses that device. I mean, a lot of them do from the from the old days. Um, but yes, uh, it's it's sad because we had a, a bigger role. Well, we, I say, the film composer particularly, yeah. um, you know, had a bigger role in film than they do now. Yeah. I mean, um, it seems to me, looking at it very much from the outside, I mean, um, I haven't tried to write film, film music for film for a very long time. I went, I did a course at the London Film School and never really, never really followed through. I'm, I'm really a player and a player. What do you play, Andy? Guitar, guitar. That's how I'm really make my money playing. But anyway, it seems to me I, was, I watched I watched all of the Hunger Games films just to, just because it's something that you worked on. I watched a, a few things you've done recently, and it seems like you and James Newton Howard are, are sort of still fighting the good fight immensely. I, I would, my my wife, as I say, is a musician who actually worked on a film. She sang on a film that you orchestra the second mummy movie i think she did that session the second mummy movie if i worked on that i might have only done a few things as part oh, okay of okay but any, anyway whatever but we were, we were watching one of the one of the big scenes in in the hunger games movies i can't even remember which movie it was but um i just turned to her and said imagine this without the music it mm. just it really needs it so it adds scale and there do there do seem to be a lot of um I, I know you. You know, it's it's not the thing to follow themes that obviously like they used to be able to do, but it still adds the weight and leads the audience. I think if that ever dies away, that process, like decades down the way, I think films will will really lose so much impact. It so it adds so much doesn't it i mean it's it's fast i think so and i love that you notice it and appreciate it and um you know it's interesting if you listen to say all the fantastic beasts films that james did as well you're right you get that big cool hip orchestral sound um all the things we did with m night Shyamalan, and and m night liked things a little more minimal but james would still figure out how to you know give it shape and depth and I agree with you. You know the thing, Andy, that, that makes my heart ache the most? I, and many people of my age and such particularly, we got to understand orchestral music or love it as much from films as from you know, concerts and, and records. And it's sad to me that, that that's not out there to hook more people in. Yeah. And... Um, yeah, you're right. A lot of times you you'll hear uh, you know that very you know semi quaver string pattern that's very flat, you know, always repeating the same you know bar over and over, and and some triadic kind of chords maybe, and some horn melody that sounds majestic, but truthfully it's very square, and and that's you know what more people seem to kind of think is wonderful. They would never. Imagine what Nicholas Rocha did in Ben Hur, you know, or uh, El Cid. Yeah, yeah. There, there seem to be two, two, two um, 
trends that I think I wonder I wonder if you think they're a little bit unhealthy one of them is you see so many films maybe not quite not on the level that you guys work at but you know you might see in current movies a lot of low drone atmosphere as if that's yeah. scoring and it isn't really scoring it's just I wonder if there's, there's almost a frequency effect of just low drones it's like oh this is mysterious you know let's have a really really low I know it's frustrating because in a weird way it can work fine but you're right it's so overused it's kind of like you know um the obvious things are probably obvious and cliches because they work but after a while yeah yeah you know i wonder andy you've made me think something if because there's so much product now especially since streaming came about as to before when it mostly was film releases tv things and because so many more people have the keys to the kingdom by having their gear in their home with samples of it, we're getting that we're getting overly inundated with all those same effects because most people that are doing them don't know what came before they might think this is oh you know the director and them are going oh listen to this oh i love that it's not in the way of anything but it's they don't realize it's you know there might be other ways to do it and it's the old there's nothing new under the sun so we're probably getting i'm always worried we're getting uh it's the right word numbed if you will to the effect of a lot of things because it's just out there so constantly and so much just yeah. like music playing everywhere you go restaurants cafes this and that yeah. i mean um it's to me, it so cheapens it because I wish music was only actively listened to. Even when I was a kid, when the radio was on, I listened. I'm not saying one shouldn't put it on in the background for joy. That's fine, too. But you're choosing to turn it on. Yeah. And it's just like everybody wants the little velvety ambient noise thing in the background. And uh, it's I know I sound like the, you know, the, the older guy ranting now, but uh, no, not at all. Not at all. The other trend I wanted I wanted to mention was that thing that that it's, it's been around for decades now, but that thing where drum groove or or dramatic, almost drum solo kind of led um, music, as if that's something too. I mean, there are people who use that stuff very the big, well, like the big deep toms and the yeah, and the hard runs and all those like boom, 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 boom. yeah, all that. You know, I mean, yeah. and it's powerful and it and it's visceral and it. It does kind of always work, but you're right. We are hearing it so much. And, you know, it's cool when Hans or James or even Howard Shore and Lord of the Rings or whomever and others, when they do that, um, it's cool. But so many people can kind of give a, an impression of doing that. They're not lucky enough like we are to have these killer players at Abbey Road or Air Studios doing percussion overdub sessions, which is what we do, yeah. where... Paul Clarvis and you know or the the little group they just come in and they 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 try stuff for us or stuff's written out and it's just that's the one great thing is very few people will ever get the budget for that but most people can sound close enough to that being as the audience doesn't notice anymore they listen on their phone they listen on an iPad and um, it it does make make a difference yeah yeah I'm tempted to say something and. I'm not sure how you land, but this shows how I need to get a life. But the truth is, it's just I'm such a nerd. I'm I'm always I'm, the one thing about the internet and social media is it now allows anybody to perpetuate information that may be a bit false. Yeah. And it's picked up because there's a lot of people out there, maybe they're just learning. And so they grab onto something that could be slightly incorrect and they never research it and they carry on with it and they spread it. And if you and um, I, I see that in, in language and facts. And I saw an Instagram post today. I'll keep it to myself, but it was a pun on Easter um, saying Jesus is risen. And it was a, well, ostensibly a G sus chord. And then the next bar, it was a G sharp sus chord. Mm -hmm. But the notes were G, A, and D. And I knew the guy that posted it and I wrote, I said, I love this. I said, However, that's a D sus chord, not a G sus chord. <laughs> and clearly, you have to be so careful going doing anything on the internet. Instead of him writing back and going, oh, yeah, ha, ha, yeah, yeah, that's true. He, said, he wrote back and sent me a wiki leak saying uh, that, that um, 
you know, like proving that, no, this is also a G sus because you can have the third drop down to the second, G, A, D. And uh, there are, no, I looked online, there are enough sites about that. There are enough people out there that are going to believe that. No one's going to listen to me because I have been studying chords since I was young. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've always been known to know notation well. I'm a real nerd. And I'm like, oh, no, that would be a, if you want to call it a G sus two, fine, but you suspend the third upwards. And I'm making a fool out of myself, Andy, and telling you the story <laughs> to say, I have to let it go, but I realize information will change. And I don't mind evolution. I don't mind the language evolving. But as Christopher Palmer, God rest his soul, used to say about my countrymen, that Americans often make up words because they don't know there's already words that exist. <laughs> <laughs> No comment. No comment. Uh, I know. I know. And it's it's frustrating because um, I don't know. I, I I think it's the same thing with I used to say it might have been frustrating enough that somebody might not say no a Mozart symphony or a good orchestral performance. But what actually really breaks my heart is when somebody goes to a concert and maybe the performance isn't that good, but because they are so underexposed to quality playing. They're like, oh, that's wonderful. And I wish we lived in a world where there was a little more discernment. I wish music was still taught in all schools yeah. and part of everyday life. And um, to me, that would be the world I'd want to in inhabit. It's like if I were a football player and ended up in a country where almost nobody played. And when they did play, it was different rules that were only the different because they didn't know there was all this well thought out rules over time. And uh, yeah. so. I know it sounds like I'm ranting, but I'm kind of... It doesn't at all. It doesn't at all, because some, if we're not careful, something really precious to us all, because music, as, as we all know, is, is, is a force for good in that even anybody who spends any amount of time working on music is plugging into a way of collating information, a way of, of examining things, a way of cross-relating things that isn't that common in a lot of disciplines so uh, there's a lot in music apart from the stuff we study in music i um, i, I want to come back it. to it you, you said you guys, it so eloquently i mean that's exactly right what you said yeah i mean you as i say you guys I, i'm talking about you and the people you, you orchestrate for um are definitely fighting a good fight i tell you one thing i've got i'm looking at my notes here and I look a bit deranged looking at my other screen over here but uh -huh. i think i have to say that I've also got to say a little thank you to our mutual friend, Chris Barnard, for connecting. Uh, lovely guy, yeah. I, I talked, uh, Chris, uh, I hadn't even noticed any of the details of this movie, but I'd watched the movie Joker, and Chris said, oh, my friend worked on that. He he, he did a lot of work on that. And yeah. Oh, man, that, I mean, that score is so great because it sounds so contemporary. It sounds like it's in the tradition, but you found a, a sound which I think I, I, that's got to be that has to be uh in danger of being very influential score of that i think which would be which would, could only be good for all of us but he did such a great job in creating this mood that i think those people who are who are conditioned to to, to uh appreciate the very simplistic stuff can plug into it but it's got the stuff that musos who've been around and have a deep appreciation of music yes. it's, it's very artful the way you orchestrated that it's I, I just listened to a bit uh, a, a couple of hours ago, and it's just, uh, it's called uh, Hoyt's Office or something, the cue is called. Oh, yes, it's yes. Imps and the brooding strings. It's, it sounds like something that, um, it's almost like some of those things, like, almost like that interstellar kind of thing is, it, it's in that world of that kind of sound, but you created this sort of, not really minimalist, but this sound that, really made that movie it's like the you, the music you guys put together and the way you orchestrated and the way the music was written it really is like uh, like all great film music it's, it's a character in the movie it really it's just on the right side of really uncomfortable for the whole movie it's that's you 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 did a masterful piece of work on that movie it's really well it's kind of you to say you but the truth is i have to give most of the credit to hilder and her, her writing partner sam because yeah, what they did was unconventional. If if you got another composer to write it, they might have written an interesting score. But it was, like you said, it was just on the edge of 
you know, a lesser person would have just had some drums, like you said, holding or something. But they just moved things and bent notes and, and you know, very, and yes, I mean, maybe I helped in getting those, that fragility of the sound and all that, um, because I suggested that we use some Baroque and uh, medieval, meaning vials, instruments along with the regular strings. Yeah. Um, but, you know, her, her cello playing alone, just the sound of it, because I've conducted some of the Joker live concerts, you know, the orchestra with the film. Wow. And I mean, as good as any cellist might be in that, it, it, there's something in her sound that is so characterful. And you were right, ever since she won, you know, the awards for those uh, just over three years ago, it's my understanding that loads of people have been trying to do scores or they're asked to do scores with solo cello, solo cello, but nobody can, it's like when the Blair Witch Project came out, suddenly they're like, make a lot of more films like that. Well, you can't, that was innovative and new at the time and uh, yeah. singular in that sense. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, a, it's really unusual, very powerful, very, very powerful. So, yeah, what, I mean, obviously it's like asking how long is a piece of spring, but what sort of time constraints do you normally get when you, you get it? What sort of range of time constraints? Do you ever get loads of time or is it normally just you get the gig, you just crack on immediately? And most of the time you're under kind of, uh, you know, the duress of the of the deadline. I mean, when I, in my younger days, I'd be up all night before the sessions. Um, you know, I can't do that anymore. Uh, you know, but we might get um, five, six weeks, we might get two weeks. That's why sometimes on a film, you'll see a crew of people as orchestrators. Maybe one or two of us did the bulk of it and the other two or three did, you know, help, helped bring it home as it were, um, because of the schedules. It, it all depends on the studio, the director, the composer, how quickly the music's given out. But we rarely get a lot of time. And when we do, you know, it's easy to kind of kind of contemplate your navel about it longer such that you're still then feel like you're running out of time when you're really ready to you know sign off on things yeah right well fair enough um, so when when you get say james newton howard for instance does he tend to give you lots of little notes you talked you talk about that earlier does he tend to give you lots of little guidelines to as to what what he what instruments he wants to carry certain lines or well, in his way, you know, I've worked with James since 1994, and back then, um, doing demos with MIDI and a, D and a DAW and all that was really just sort of, sort of if not in its infancy, then pre-teen, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I'm sorry. So I might still get some handwritten sketches. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, and... Uh, but but really mostly uh, not long after that you know he will perform everything as meant as most all composers do uh, to create a demo and I'll get a the MIDI or a MIDI printout and you know with James is is we know he knows what he wants you know maybe he won't always give all the specifics but you kind of know he's going for this or that or the scope wise and he has uh, high standards and a amazing um, you know kind of you know he's got that genius so you know you can't you, you we were you know you, you want to get it right <laughs> um and uh yeah so i i guess what i'm trying to say is uh, you know maybe there'll be sections of music where you know it's meant to be really big but because he might not have the time because he certainly has the knowledge maybe there's no woodwinds in the in the demo but we know that he would he would want them if there are specific beautiful colors and woodwind solos or ethnic instruments, he always decides those with the directors. Those days back when the orchestrator might come up with that are, are rare now because everybody wants to hear demos before we get the music now. So they kind of want to hear it, the house mostly built before wow. they live in it. Um, whereas Mark Shaman will most of the time will just give me piano parts because we have a real good symbiosis and he trusts what I do and uh, again there'll be times when for whatever reason he might give me a far more specific thing but uh, so it's a varied range uh, of, of things but you know most of all it's important to me and I think other orchestrators hopefully to honor the composer's voice the last thing I want to do is just have some generic way of always doing things 
Sure. Sometimes I've learned, if you will, maybe uh, the way Rachel would voice something, weirdly enough, might work in a James Q or a Mark Q, or something the way Mark would do it might work in a James or Ray. Like all yeah, crossover with some information, but but I wouldn't ever try to alter their voice because they all have specific voices and it's not my place um, to do that. The thing about orchestration that is hard to explain to people is certainly uh, the more counterpoint, the more melody there is, the harder our job is because we have to make sure everything is heard properly. Uh, when interesting textures are demanded, um, maybe there's synth effects and we're recreating them with something with the orchestra. That's a that that gives us a chance to you know work our gray matter, um, but also it's very important. I say this to students when I speak to them, that the score is completely clear, so that it the players have almost no questions. I, every once in a while, I'm teased for how specific I am with the strings, whether it's Divisi or harmonics or which desk play which. I'm not doing that as some show off. I mean, you know the same. I, it's just, I know if I just leave it up to them, it will take them a little more time to work it out. Sometimes I might have thought I worked it out well, and they might have a better way to do it. But we try to make sure every little thing is thought of on the page so that the copyist won't have a question. Oh, the horns were in chords here. Suddenly they went to unison. Are they all playing or is only one playing? Um, you know, all the phrasing, the dynamics, everything. Sometimes I guess what I'm saying is just that all that detail work it's important makes a huge difference i must save a lot of time on, on the actual session you and you don't want to waste time on sessions yeah no not with an orchestra sitting there. no definitely not um how much do you find that your background in jazz from when you were younger it informs your work does it, does it do you find yourself recalling any of that experience or, or do you see it all as a separate pursuit in music well um in terms of i have done things sort of you know in a kind of modest big band style um more you know um i'd say 40s to 60s style than you know kind of uh a gill evans don sebesky i don't know you see i i in other words if somebody wanted a really killer big band chart i would suggest they hire somebody that's an expert in that but if they're like well we don't have time whatever you just do the closest you can Yes, I understand it, and I can do it. Um, but just like with you know, understanding nuances of rebellion string uh, uh, devices and all that, where I feel I know that well, I would always say get somebody that's an expert. Um, but I remember the first time I heard Walton's first symphony, and I was like, oh my god, these sound like jazz chords in a symphony. There's like a a G eleven chord, and there was a sharp nine chord over. And I learned later, because I met Lady Walton, and I worked on some Walton things early on, that uh, that uh, uh, Sir William had actually a friend who was a jazz pianist who he learned a lot from. So I think jazz is always great to have as a background, understanding the extension of harmonies. We both know jazz is as much about rhythm, improvisation. So uh, it never hurts to be well-rounded, is all I'm trying to say, both with orchestral literature of all sorts, um and and jazz i mean i admit i i might not listen to a lot of you know metal or you know or <laughs> prog rock or all that to help me with my job but i also used to write charts for bands when i was young to make money because singers needed charts from songs that were on the radio so that their five or six piece band could play them so i certainly understand how to write rhythm charts in that way i know this might sound like oh Hello, aren't I wonderful? What I mean is it saddens me that that skill or that need for that skill is gone because it's great training. I feel for young people starting out, there are far fewer avenues that help them write in a well-rounded way than there were when I started. Um, you know, I wrote for lots of different odd groups and I, I count all that towards giving me experience to be able to do what I do. Uh, now, you know, I don't think writing in a sequencer at home is the same benefit, sadly. No, the sure. players taught me so much, you know. Yeah, yeah. And what I'm thinking, really, I, I, my next question is, do you think, I mean, the pursuit of learning how jazz works means that, as you say, you, you jazz and groove music, you know, deep groove music, 
Yeah. Um, you have to train yourself to discern the defining characteristics of a of a particular style, don't you? You've got to cultivate your ear and your understanding of what lines are being played, what voicings are being played over what chords. And I was thinking, going back to that Hunger Games stuff, that, that sort of, there's a huge sort of uh, bluegrassy, sort of rootsy, almost Celtic kind of thing going on there. Yes. Have you had to apply that discernment to those kind of other styles, like roots music and that kind of stuff? When in those big sports, for instance, did you score those bits out, or did you have a bunch of guys and say, "This is the framework"? A mix of the two. A mix of the two. You know, you definitely you don't want to put nothing in front of them and just say, "Just unless you actually do, you have a proper group and you say." hey, do your thing and we'll produce it, meaning, oh, could you go a little higher there? Or could you do that there? Um, or we'll write out a skeletal part. Uh, it might have chord symbols, it might have melodies, it might have some rhythms. And as you know, nobody, the players will always make it better for anything that has a sense of improvisation yeah. to it, um, whether that's jazz or whatever. I remember George, speaking of final analysis, George Fenton, Oh, it was that film, I think, or another one, uh, where he was working out a piece of what we call source music, meaning it's music that's, as you know, coming from in the film. It was a pianist in a hotel bar. Yeah. And he was sitting there wrenching over, should this be an A-flat 6 here or an F minor 7, which, as you know, are basically the same, but for the bass note. And I remember saying to him, um, I, why are you stressing over it? Because Mike Lang is going to make it better anyway. Mike Lang was a brilliant pianist, and he played a pianist. It's like, just give him a lead sheet and chord symbols and let him put some substitutions in and all that. Yeah. Uh, you know, if we were writing it out for an orchestra, you'd have to be specific. But uh, I think there's no harm to being well-rounded uh, in any way you can. <laughs> have you ever been called on to pull particular guys in for those kind of uh, particular styles? Do you ever get involved in that? And the actual choice of who, who you bring in or... or... Do the fixers just take care of all that stuff over there? Uh, usually, that you mean in terms of the orchestrator. If you say you're getting somebody to play, play the trust thing, it would either be the um, if we already would know people, or the composer might know already know people, or yes, we might say to the fixer, "Do you know a good? It could be a you know a musette player or an accordion player in what style? Oh, um, you know Russian Jewish jazz or or French cafe, you know, because as you know, there's styles within styles. And um, so it would be a mix of things. And uh, where we may have heard a player, and, and a lot of players are also able to do a lot of different things. Like one of my mates, Simon Chamberlain, who I've known forever, you know, he can play Mozart as beautifully as he can play, you know, a stride piano. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great, great. Um, so, so in your time, with the evolution of, of of scores, have you had to sort of stay up to date with electronic music, is, or do you do you do a lot of programming with that kind of modernistic electronic music? Well, I mean, one of the things that's great about James is he's always been really hip about hybrid scores. You know, he's really good about that yeah. in such a cool way. Um, I've always I I would was using patch chords and cutting two inch tape at at my university. <laughs> So I've never been uncomfortable with electronics. Um, I've always had gear, you know, ever since my first Fost X4 track and a Korg Poly 61 with an arpeggiator. Uh, the 90s, I had all the, you know, the wall of gear, the S760s, the Ak Akai's, all that. And um, I've kept up with it. But to answer your question, again, I find it goes to musicianship. Uh, like sometimes James will have something and I'll hear something in a sample and he, he never meant for the orchestra to do anything with it. And maybe just to tie the orchestra to the sample. I remember on, um, oh God, was it Red Sparrow? Uh, for some weird reason, you know, you know, you all, you just hear things. I thought, I hear a high D, you know, like a ninth of a middle C in these samples. Wouldn't it be cool to put bass harmonic with that and a very high bassoon? Uh, and I swore James was going to tacit it. Because I remember I uh, when he recorded that, um, I was stuck in L.A. because I wasn't well. Uh, 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 I, I, I mean, to the point where I couldn't travel. And um, I left. I was certain. And then one of his tech guys wrote and said, he kept both things. He didn't tacit them. And the bassoonist to come in on a high D, super quiet. Um, 
so yeah, we like to nerd out on stuff like that. Uh, you also don't want to take up so much space that the electronics can't do their thing. But yes, yeah, sometimes it's cool to tie in the orchestral stuff with the electronics and amplify them or vice versa. And then to come to Joker, um, I worked with Johan Johansson on a film called Mother and the score in the end, they didn't keep it, but not because he didn't do a good job. He did an amazing score. But as the music editor, Nancy said, I remember her saying, as they were working on the film, Aronofsky and her decided the film kept saying, it was like pushing out the music, like, I don't need this. And Johan was on board with that. And I remember his cool sense of electronics and orchestra. So fast forward two years later, the reason Hilder um, and Sam got in touch with me is Sam worked with Johan and knew me then. And when I got stuff from them, I could hear all the processing on even on the strings and the such. And so my my to my uh, uh, challenge was let me get a live orchestra to recreate these colors. And at one point I said to Hilda, I said, I gotta warn you, some of these I don't think we're gonna be able to recreate. And she said, Don't worry, I'll have laptops, I'll process them. Guess what? In the end, we didn't need to. Oh wow. The players were so good, we had great engineer, great room. That mix of you know, using a few solo vials and and the, the Baroque sounding instruments and real strings playing in certain ways, you know. Um, I remember God Rest Her Soul, a violinist here um, named Sophie. She passed away three years ago. Um, or was it two now? I can't even remember. Um, anyway, um, of cancer. But I called her up and I said, hey, can I ask you something? If I, if I want to really this kind of effect, what's a good thing to say to the strings? And she said, if you bow very slowly across the strings, you get this kind of like, you know, this sound that's not uh, comfortable, like it's gonna, it's breaking up a little bit. Or she said, by, bow very fast and very lightly, it's it's much more ghostly. And and I thought I knew a lot of stuff about the string instruments, but I can always learn. And so, um, you know, some of those things paid off. And that came from hearing the electronics. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the electronics, but I still find an orchestra in a room with a proper recording engineer and all that gives greater depth in a filmic sense. Yeah, yeah. I worked on Harry Potter 6 because the composer from Harry Potter 5 and Harry Potter 6, on 5, I guess he mostly wrote strings. And David Yates, who we've worked with a lot, wanted a little bit more filmic sound for the next one. And... I was recommended by the engineer, Peter Cobbin, and, you know, I would add brass and things like, because it gives more scope. Yeah. Strings are wonderful on their own, but for a big film, like a Harry Potter film, you need depth, you need weight. Maybe you don't even hear the brass behind the strings, but they give, you know, it's thicker, it's, 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 it sits in a giant cinema better, and I feel that way about electronics. They're cool. I mean, if you listen to Gremlins, say, by Jerry Goldsmith, some of the sounds sound dated as they would. Yeah. But on the other hand, Jerry Goldsmith, like you listen to Poltergeist, there's very little percussion, even though, you know, it's not like that thing where he's relying on drums to make things work. He just know how to make an orchestra do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I love that kind of thing. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love Jerry Goldsmith. That's really interesting. We've been talking about the Joker because I thought those strings were affected. That's wild. That's wild. Yeah, so I'm not saying none of them were, but most of the time, that's what we got in the room. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, what, a, what an amazing thing. One should never forget, you know, I've had to uh, do more than my share of uh, aleatoric effects, uh, you know, dissonant effects, strange textures and all that over the years. And when something which you probably know about called symphobia came out quite a few years back, it was uh, yet again, uh, you know, press a key on the keyboard and you get uh, a sample that was been created, you know, with a lot of time and processing of this, of something going, and some of my colleagues were like, oh, geez, how am I supposed to recreate that? It's going to take forever. And I said, you know what? The only reason that the composer used that effect is that's all he had. We have imagination. So we get something close in the same range. We don't have to get it exact. Yeah. We can bring so many more variations to the table. Yeah. Um, and that freed me because otherwise the thought of having to recreate something that's impossible to take down by ear and often impossible to recreate in a film recording session, because as you know, when samples are made, 
the group sitting there, uh, they, they can produce it, process it, tell them what to do, overdub, add to it, alter it. Uh, so, you know, I, I guess I'm saying that the same with the electronics. Of course, there are such cool electronic things that have their own voice and have a place, no doubt. But why waste a big orchestra if somehow you can find a way to work with that, you know? Um, but, you know, that's that's me. I'm probably crying in the wilderness. <laughs> oh, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, I love those sort of Penderecki kind of effects. You, you ever check, you know, everybody knows that Threnody piece on there. Of knows. course, it, you're going to laugh, but, you know, that's like so old hat now. And oh, sure, fact, sure, yeah, yeah. You know, I stopped asking the string players to do something that they hated, which is, you know, tapping the nut of the bow on the right. wood. They don't want to do that. We've got percussion instruments now to do that. Oh, but yes, those, you know, whether they're quarter toned or chromatic, you know, big clusters and and all that that aleatoric effect of you know pizzicatoing and random or tapping the bow or mixing it all up yeah i mean that's been going on since the mid 60s when he wrote that and uh, have, you, have you ever heard that term squeaky gate music which is more more applied <laughs> to free jazz which is very disrespectful oh it is disrespectful. great musicians of free jazz um but I, I love that term squeaky gate music but I thought it was quite interesting because you you check out Penderecki's symphonies and they're nothing like that piece where everybody thinks that's what he did. They're, have you, had, in your experience, given that you've got a lot, an uncommon amount of experience, is Penderecki somebody who's ever mentioned in that world? Do people is he an influence on and not oh, just yeah, that, but not that piece, but the symphonies and all that stuff? Have you ever? Well, you know, like his is it Saint John's Passion. Oh yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Luke, Luke Passion is. But it isn't the Saint Luke's. I'm more forgetting which one has a lot of effects. You know, don't forget Ligeti. His Requiem has yeah. a lot. Every desk is written on a different note. Um, one has to be careful because you know film recordings need expediency. You don't want to be lazy and just put a triangle and say to the string players make an effect. But yet you also to specify every desk and all that. It just isn't practical. So you look for a way to get as much as you can from the group quickly. Um, to use Esa Pekka Salonon's term, you know, kind of uh, uh, controlled um, aleatoric music, where it's aleatoric but within a parameter. Yeah, right, right. But yes, the Penderecki, we talked about that back in the 80s and 90s. Of course, it was influential, but it's been, it's so. The people now that are discovering it, it's kind of funny because um, I'm like, what? You're, you know, uh, yeah, I have students say to me if I do a lecture, you know, on Zoom or in a course, you know, oh, can you teach us extended techniques in brass and strings? And I'm like, first of all, I prefer the term contemporary techniques because um, because if you think about it, a flutter tongue was considered extended technique 200 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, a lot of people like to rely on that. For you know things, but as I tell them, a lot of that stuff makes more sense in solo and concert pieces. Um, you know, we've all done strange glisses. We've all done, you know. I mean, I can have the strings, and I have them do some of these things. You know, moving their bow across the string this way rather than this way, just get. Yeah. But also, there are so many cool electronic samples that can do that kind of stuff now. So you know, uh, you have to choose your you you know your reason for doing things uh, and not just do it because, you know, that's why I, I like to think if somebody really understands the literature and the history, when they do these things, they'll be done with a, a meaningful reason and not just because, oh, isn't this cool? Not knowing that it had already been done a billion times before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Oh, amazing. Well, it's, it's great to talk to you. Uh, one other thing I wanted to ask you, do yeah. you ever get tasked with making the mock-ups you're saying that james newton howard uh, i guess it's common for a composer to need that to sell their cues to the director i suppose so it needs they have to, to pretty play. much everybody right well everybody does write that way that that now whether they need to write that way uh whether it helps them as a and i i use this word carefully because if you then put this out on you know some tiktok video and people hear just this word they're going to think i'm a real asshole but as a crutch it's a brilliant thing you know it can give you instant feedback uh, we all can get numb to hearing things in our head when they're being sounded back to us. But to answer your question, almost never on films, I know a lot of times orchestrators do on certain projects, maybe the composer will say, you know, can you make a better mock-up from what I've done? Here's the basics. 
or they'll have their tech guys do it because they really need to sell it to the director. I mean, that's the thing that's changed in 15 years. You can get away with less. You have to have better and better production value often right. uh, because it's just expected. And if I may say this, the really most sad thing for me, I liken it, and I used this phrase earlier, to somebody saying to an architect, you know, uh, I want you to design me a house, but before you do, can you make me a demo model of it so I can make sure, even down to where the plugs are. And until you, it's better if you build that. I'm just going to say this, samples themselves and sometimes the composer's imagination and the time constraint might make them not come up with certain textures or interesting things that I would. Yeah. And the problem is, if they've created a demo, and let's say it only has this much scope to it, and it's been listened to by the studio and the director, and it's so fallen in love with, I have to be careful not to go too far afield of that. And stuff that could have been brought into the mix that I think could have given it a little more and without taking away from, from the desired you know goal of what this cue is doing, get lost. It's back to what we were saying at the beginning of this. Uh, the, you know, if the samples are all people know and they write to what makes the sample sound best, there are so many colors and textures that you just can't do that way. Um, I mean, years back, you know, I, I mean, and I'm not even the one to, you know, why should I be given credit for this? From my years of listening to jazz and to orchestral music, you know, I might mix a, you know, a medium high bassoon with an alto flute with a muted horn and that color blended together gives you a new, um, an amalgamated color that you you can't do in samples because they're not in the same room uh, vibing off each other's overtones and, and matching balance. Yeah. Uh, and, and also, we haven't brought this up, but more and more films, the scores are being recorded in modules, you know, strings one day, brass one day. So never can you get that true alchemy of the the disparate instruments maybe it's a viola a trombone and a harp doing something together uh and it and it sounds really cool uh but if they're not playing at the same time together and hearing each other and the way they're tuning and phrasing and all that, you won't have it and you'll never sample anything like that because it doesn't make sense in samples right right and thankfully i'm still allowed to sometimes push those things in and more often than not, thankfully, you'll get a, oh, that's really cool. I like that. But every once in a while, just to cover my backside, as they say, I'm, I may also make sure that the more straightforward example is there as well. Um, so, I, you know, I know it's, it's, uh, it, it might sound quite nerdy, but, you know. <laughs> no, I mean, the proof is in the pudding, isn't it? I mean, I listened to, or rather watched, Maleficent the other day, just because you. Oh, great you, score! James oh James. man, the sound of that music—it's just oh god, it's so beautiful. I just I was just wrapped in the music, um, and and it's it, this is a product of your experience and your diligence and your talents. But without that wealth of thought, you wouldn't be aware of all of these possibilities. They're obviously what your head's full of. You've got you've got all this experience, and and you're not letting up until things sound great i mean if you've got an undergraduate or uh, you know somebody's just graduated you've got that level of experience of arranging or music in general you're not going to have that bag of tricks there it needs somebody who's put the hours in and, and and is willing to work to that point where they're looking for those yeah. deep possibilities james always talks about you know because he's a very diligent worker he, he says just it's time in the saddle meaning it's sometimes like how do you come up with this stuff and yeah you know, if you listen over the years from when he started scoring films in the mid 80s with the film Head Office onwards, you see the, there's already the talent there, but you see his, uh, I mean, sometimes I get, I would get like freaked. I'd get it, his MIDI back and the way he voiced the trombones was like perfect. And I'm like, oh, wow, you know, uh, uh, you know, like that he took the time to do that or maybe he saw how I had done it in previous scores, just like I learned from him. I hope they learned from me or any composer you work with, uh, that symbiosis. And, you know, we cannot discount the players. The players, I always say, they make my orchestration sound good. A fantastic recording engineer, a good room. It's it's a whole group effort. It always is. Yeah. 
Um, and I'd love to sit and say, oh, yes, I'm so important. And, and I know I am. But sometimes where, where I'm really important is to make sure I don't, I'm not some weak link in a chain of professionalism so nothing falls down. Uh, and other times, yes, I won't lie to you. I have been the one that created the impact and the sound of something. I could tell you many a film score from the different composers where I, you know, I did that. But you haven't asked me a question that a lot of people ask me, which is why did I never go into scoring films? And it was well, too. You've done. I've done a few things, but the truth is, uh, Andy, it was kind of twofold. Early on, I got hooked in with these brilliant composers on great projects, and I love writing for orchestra, and I like working with a musician. So there was that, and uh, combined with, was I good enough? Would my music be good enough? And the secondary one was, oh, man, I hate the thought of networking, you know, going and trying to meet producers. I'm not a very forward guy, you know, and... It's like, oh, you got to use my music, you got to use my music. I'm kind of the opposite, usually. And uh, I bring that up to say that um, I very much appreciate, you know, the composer, the hard work they put in, the time they put in, uh, you know, and the difficult stuff they have to put up with and deal with. And it's not easy. And Danny Elfman told me once, you know, we were talking about he was in a room with six people. And he, I said, how do you know which one to listen to? And he says, I find out which one has the final say. <laughs> And that kind of shrewdness, that business acumen, all that stuff, that's important too. And uh, it's not me, you know, composers, most of the time, particularly in films, I say their 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 job is the, the bigger picture. They're fashioned for that. And uh, they shouldn't be bogged down with the detail work. It's fair what Benny Herman said, Bernard Herman, you know, that like, you know, wow, you know, composers should do their own orchestration. Yes. However, if you look at Miklas Rocha's sketches or often John Williams or whoever, they're fairly clear. Okay, they may just write woodwinds when there's some high chords playing and leave it up to us to choose. But ultimately, you know, there are only a few ways you're going to do that. They may specify the exact voicing or not. You can do that in a three or four line pencil sketch. I have that skill too because I learned it. Nobody now would know how to do that. I tell students to take an orchestral score, Debussy's Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn. I say, um, Reduce it to a piano part of two or three lines. Write in the orchestration like oboe two, point an arrow to that note. And then months later, go and try and score it out from that sketch again. And right. then compare it to the final score. You learn so much that way. Oh, that's great. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's a good one. That's great. Can I ask I you another question, Jeff? Of course. In your experience, have you, have you come across a lot of situations where composers were bashing their heads against the wall, fighting against directors' preconceptions with temp tracks. Is that a big thing still in, in music? It is. The thing I said about getting a demo and the restrictions that might offer, the bane of composers' lives too is getting, because it exists, temp tracks which are made often to sell the film uh, before the composer even starts. You know, they, they can show a seemingly finished product to, to investors. Um, I've heard composers say, oh, I like it because it tells me what the director wants. But again, it's the death of that symbiotic thing of a director and composer coming up with a, vid, a vision. Think of what Morricone did in those Westerns with Leone. You know, uh, if some pre-existing music was written and Morricone was forced to write like that, we might never come up with all the, ooh, ah, ooh, you know, down, down. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's just the way it is. I think it's why everything becomes more generic sounding in some ways. And, and uh, you know, if you ever watch films over the last 30 years and they have a classical piece in them, you'll probably notice, why is it the same five classical pieces always in it, you know? It's always and always Pachelbel's Canon or, yeah. you know, or this piece of Tchaikovsky or that, uh, you know, uh, piano piece by whether it's whomever, Bach or Mozart. It's because most of the time the people, the the people in the filmmaking business or the supervisors that decide when somebody says, oh, I need a piece of music for this wedding, it's gotta be classical. They'll just go to what they heard in the previous film and it just keeps getting perpetuated. Yeah, like a uh, playlist, classical music's greatest hits, just choose it, one. It's like the classic FM kind of version of things. Yeah, you get the, the, the same things over and over. I'd be so amazing if suddenly there was a different piece used and it worked just as well, you know. But it's to do with that exposure, isn't it? That's a really interesting point you made earlier, that um, movies have got people, musicians and 
the general public listening to orchestral music it's, it's a really positive thing isn't it it has been historically right. it's got people checking out I've, things like john williams has got people checking out the planets you know what i mean yeah exactly what i mean with john, with john williams i don't buy into the oh he just uses classical music he knew classical music and he also knows jazz extremely well you know he's an excellent jazz pianist yeah yeah and um you know, he studied in a Prokofiev and, and Tchaikovsky and Stravinsky and, and some holes and all that. So, and yes, sometimes, okay, yes, the theme from Superman, you know, da da da, ya, da is the same theme at the end of Strauss's Death and Transfiguration. Da da da, ya, da, ya, da. But whether he did that knowingly or not, in a way, I could think that's kind of cool. Think of it Death and Transfiguration, Superman, you know, what happened in. But it's not because John Williams isn't inventive. My God, is he ever inventive? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes I think it's cool to allude to the classics. And, and you know, yes, I know, you probably know, there's the, um, you know, da-da-da, bee-ba-ba-bum, da 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 You know, that's the John Williams theme. The first one is Korngold's King's Row. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, yeah I think people that accuse somebody of ripping something off and they're incorrect, it's because they have too limited of a knowledge of the history. And the, we all do this. Stravinsky said he he happily will steal some Mozart because it's so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Well, look at jazz. I mean, you know, we're all jazz improvisers or in different periods of jazz. Yes. Everybody's stealing from everybody. It's, it's, what it's, is that? I think, was it, where did I, did I see this? It wasn't Adam Neely that did this. And speaking of Adam Neely, I'll, I'll tell you something in a minute. Uh, I saw some documentary on uh, on one of uh, Thelonious Monk's songs, and then it went back 30 to 40 years and showed all the versions that won by a, a female composer that had been written in jazz. It was the same. Benny Goodman had one. You know, there was this argument. Was this a ripoff? Was this a... a, a... And um, it's so true. Yeah. And the Adam Neely thing, what, 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 was, what did Adam Neely uh, do in one of his um, talks that was so interesting? Oh, it's gone out of my head. Uh, I, I I really enjoy his talks. Um, yeah, very yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. And his force for good got people really thinking about how music works. And yes, uh, yes, he does. he does. He does. Jeff, I'm going to let you get back to it. But thanks Thank so you. much for taking the time. Really interesting stuff, and I really appreciate it. I know oh, it's a pleasure meeting you. You're you you're an absolutely hip, cool dresser. Dresser, I love that. You're a very nice guy. Uh, um, and thank you for the insightful questions and. Uh, Hope I was of some use. Oh, it's amazing. Very kind of you to take the time. And I've really enjoyed the last couple of weeks. I've just been listening to stuff you worked on nonstop. And I've, I've, I feel I've enhanced by the experience. I've lived here long enough to feel compelled to say something self-deprecating, but I'll just... Don't, don't do it. Don't I'll do say it. thank you, don't thank do you for, for appreciating what we do. Yeah, you're the man. Okay. All the best, Jeff. Okay. See you down the road. All my Bye. best. Bye-bye.